But we're going to do more than talk about revival. We're going to experience revival. Can you say amen? amen? Isn't it about time we stop just talking about the things of God and begin to experience the things of God? For many years, I've had the opportunity to read through the Bible, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do that as a church. I like reading the Bible together, having a specific plan where we're all reading the same thing at the same time. And then what I have customarily done is as we've done that week's, week's reading, I've picked something from that passage that you have read that week and that we kind of listen to what God is trying to say to us from the Scriptures. You know, that's a different kind of way to study the Bible. It's not just to try to find out dates and places and uh, the history of what has happened and all of the facts, but to listen to God speak to us from His Word. It's powerful. It's transformative to open the Bible and to try to hear God's voice speak to us about the experience that we're going through. As I've done that and I've reached some portions of the Old Testament where you read about God's people, the, the Israelites, you know, the God's people had some good times and they had some bad times. In fact, they had a lot of bad times, unfortunately. And it wasn't really God's fault because God was very clear what he wanted from his people and what he wanted to do through his people. And so as, I, as I'm reading the stubborn followers of God, I almost get angry, you know, reading the Bible. And then, you know, I, I, I ultimately come to that. How could they do that? How could they reject God like that? How could they turn their back? How could they question God's blessing, you know, when they're under that pillar of cloud, when that fire, you know, there were so many visible signs of God's blessing. How could they have ever doubted? It's easy to point your finger at other people, isn't it? And then, ultimately, as God usually does, he turns it around and and really begins to speak to our own hearts that aren't we just as guilty? Throughout the Old Testament, particularly where the area that we're going to be studying about, we're going to get to that in just a moment, God laid out that there was a way for God's people to be blessed. And not just to be blessed, but to be blessed above all the people of the earth. He said that. If you will do what I'm asking you to do, I will bless you above all the people of the earth. I believe that's still God's will for, for us. I believe God's people should be the head and not the tail. That we should be blessed above all the people of the earth, not just so that we have things, not just that we're increased in, in, in physical things, but I'm talking about spiritual blessings. I'm talking about emotional blessings, relational blessings. God wants that because he wants to use that as a way for other people to want to know him. And so as we're reading there in the Old Testament, we come along and we see these good times and we see some bad times. And it's amazing how good the good times are and how bad the bad times are. It reminds me of a verse of Scripture I want you to turn to. Boy, if there's one principle, biblical principle, that it would be important for young and old to understand and embrace and just to accept the truth of it, it's taken from the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7 is our first text tonight, today, tonight, maybe it would be tonight. Here is a principle that we would do well to learn. Galatians 6 and verse 7. If you're there, say amen. You got it? I still hear some pages turning. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. This is an important text. Here it is. You know, those smartphones just don't make that noise. You know, I, I'm a digital guy, but I like the analog version of the Bible. I, I, I still use a digital one, but I just love to hear pages turn in God's church, don't you? And you know what? This battery never runs out. You don't have to worry about recharging this. You just have to worry about recharging this. All right, here it is, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. 
You know, that's strong language. What, what, what God is saying here is you better listen carefully to what is getting ready to follow because I'm not messing around and I'm not going to be fooled and this is important for us to know. Do not be deceived for God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Do you believe that? Oh, If we believe that to the point where we begin to live it, our lives would be spared so much heartache, so much hassle. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. It's called the law of the harvest. Here's what I've learned about the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. And also, another law of the harvest is you reap more than you sow. Friends, If we begin to sow good things in our life, we will reap good things in our life. One of the privileges I have as a pastor is get to talk to people about their spiritual life. And and often, I have had people come to me and say, Pastor, I just don't understand. I hear and see God blessing all these other people, but, but he doesn't seem to be blessing me. And inevitably, I'm gonna ask some of the some of the questions that need to be asked. Well, how is your spiritual life? What kinds of things are you doing and focusing on in your spiritual life? Oh, well, pastor, you know, I don't really have time to go to church. I don't have time to read the Bible. And and I know I should be doing things, but I don't. And then they don't understand why they're not reaping spiritual blessings because they're not sowing the right things. They're spending all of their time doing the wrong things and they begin to reap those things and they don't understand it. God says he will not be mocked. He's not going to be deceived. We need to understand the law of the harvest. It goes all the way back to the beginning of God's people as we're going to see in Deuteronomy 30 as we get there. But I want you to know, we're not not there yet, but I want you to know that God wants to bless his people. God wants to bless you. He's no respecter of person. He wants to pour his blessings out upon all of us. And yet, we know that if we will walk in certain ways, God's blessing will be there, but yet we choose often not to do that. We tend to go our own way. We tend to wander to this way or to that way. Just as it happened to the children of Israel, I believe it happens to us. It wasn't one day they woke up and said, we're not going to believe in God anymore. It wasn't that they woke up one day and said, we're not going to worship God anymore. In fact, they never stopped believing in God. They never stopped worshiping God. They just started worshiping other things too. You see, what I've learned about my relationship with God is it's all about the heart. God wants the heart. He wants the affections. He wants wants that love relationship. And friends, if I'm doing anything for God that isn't flowing out of the heart, God's going to have a problem with it. It's not about just going through the motions. It's not about just about doing the right thing. God wants us to do the right things, but he wants us to do the right things for the right reasons. Motive is important when it comes to God. And so they never stopped believing in him. They never stopped worshiping him. And I suspect that is easier to fall into than we might imagine. It's easy to find ourselves in that. And it's made me think a lot about the church today. You know, I think it's in Romans chapter 15, probably verse 9 or 6. It's, these things were written aforetime for our learning. History has a way of repeating itself. Human nature doesn't change much. The mistakes they made in times of old, are the same mistakes that we can fall into. And so I hope that when you read the Bible, you're willing to read this and to try to learn from the experiences of others so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that they did. So it's made me think a lot about the church today and asking the question, is it possible we could be in the same situation, the same circumstance, that something is not right? As I look at the people of God today, where is that hunger in that thirst for righteousness? Where is that fervor? Where is that excitement for the things of God? Where is that passion for spiritual things? There's a passage that I believe describes what's happening in the church today, and I want to share it with you 
But before I do, I, I, you know, I want you to know I love this church. I hadn't been here very long, but I love this church and I love everyone in it. I think it's important I say that before we turn to this verse, because you're not going to maybe like this verse. But just keep in mind, this is God's word and not the pastor's word. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Now you're probably thinking, I'm going to jump down to verse 20, but I'm not. We're, we'll get there one day, but we're not going to get there today. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. This is another message to a church. This is a message to God's people, a message that the Holy Spirit sends to a group of people. How'd you like to go to your mailbox today and get a letter from God? Well, some of us could be pretty excited about that. Maybe some of us wouldn't be excited about that. Probably depends on what the letter. But listen to what the Spirit says to this church. Unto the angel, verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Sardis, write, these things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, and you have a name that you are alive, but you are what? Dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Maybe not what you were expecting, was it? Isn't that a good affirming message for the pastor to share with God's people? Yeah, I'm not presuming to say that we're dead. But can we really say that we are alive the way God wants us to? Can we really say that it's no longer I who lives, but Christ that lives in me? Can we really say that? Can we really say that God occupies that first and best place in all of our lives? Friends, if not, we're in need of revival. Our church leaders discovered that long ago, and there have been an emphasis on praying for revival for God's church. As God's church has gotten older, we've gone from this movement to become almost an institution, and there is a call to revival. We're not dead. That's a resurrection. But we're not alive the way we should be, and so there's this call to a revival. Friends, we need to wake up. We need to wake up and and, and sense the days in which we're living. We need to understand that today is the day that we need to give our affections over to God unreservedly. You can't have a divided heart. God will not have that. If God doesn't have first place in your life, there's going to come a time when He's going to have no place. He has to be first. That's the issue of God's people. God's God's people wanted a divided heart. They wanted to do God's thing, but they also wanted to do their own thing. And God kept calling them back again and again and again. You have to love me with how much of your heart? All your heart. The Christian life doesn't work if your heart's divided between God and other things. It has to be given to Him. And so, friends, I want revival. Revival. I want that. I want that in my own life. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. I need revival. I believe that we could very well be that last generation that is living to see Jesus comes. And I, that's saying something because I'm kind of old. That means we don't have a lot of time left. But I believe it could happen. I believe God wants it to happen. That just as much as we want the Lord to come, you think God is not tired of all of what we he has, you know, all of what he sees here day by day? How much sinful can this world be? And so we need revival. I love the little magazines I get in the mail talking about revival in South America, in places in, in you know, all over the world, in different places. There are pockets of people that are experiencing revival. The problem is it's always some other place, some other time, some other people. But I believe we need to be praying for revival here. Here. And maybe more importantly, here. We keep waiting for the church to wake up. Maybe we need to focus on waking up ourselves. You know how a church experiences revival? When its people experience revival. If you're waiting for the church to do anything, I got, I, you know, I, I got news for you. It's about the people. 
It's about the people. And that's what we find. I love to hear about God's Spirit moving in other times and other places, but the cry of my heart is that I want it here. And here's the good news. God wants it too. God wants it. He really wants it to happen. For, for too long, as a, as a, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist early on, and I was looking around the church, and it never just seemed to grow, and I'd have these people say, oh, now, Bill, don't get old, so discouraged. God knows we're not ready. Yeah. And so he's holding these people back. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, he's holding these other people back because we, we wouldn't know how to treat them if they came. And so this, this idea that we're in rebellion was almost a part of God's plan. That was the, the idea, that he's holding these people back, and when we finally get ready, then they'll come. Well, I say bring it on. We ought to, we ought to get our... If, if, look, if we know God wants revival even more than us, then the real issue is what's keeping us from experiencing revival? That's the question we have to be asking. It isn't that God is just holding this back. God wants it more than us. And so if we know something is God's will, then all we have to do is to begin to understand, well, what is it going to take? What is it in my life that is preventing God from doing what he wants? That's what I want to talk to you about today. So we're going to go to Deuteronomy 30, and I believe that in here we find the roadmap for revival. You can't manufacture revival. You can't make this thing happen. You can't put it on the calendar and say, we're going to have revival this week to that week or whatever else. But there is a process that God lays out to us to help us move in the direction to revival. This is what I've learned. When we begin to move toward God, you know what He does? He moves to us. I love that. I love that about God. But this is what I've, I've seen. We have to take the first step. We have to be willing to turn to him. Like the prodigal son who began his journey back, God runs down the road and embraces him, but he doesn't go drag him out of the pink pen. The prodigal had to be willing to do that. So here in Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 through 6, that we read in our scriptures reading, we find God's roadmap for revival. Here's number one. There's just three steps that I want to share with you today. The first one is simply this. We need to remember. We need to remember. You know, revival, the context is that we've experienced something and we have slipped away from it. And we are hence needing revival. We use that term, the first love. Do you remember what your first love was like? Do you remember when you fell in love with Jesus for the first time? When you saw your Savior hanging on Calvary and realized He didn't do that just for the whole world. He did that for you. That it was your sin that put Him on that cross. And that Jesus willingly did that for you. Oh, I remember when I fell in love with Jesus, I couldn't stop talking about him. I couldn't stop reading his word. I'd carry the Bible around all the time. If I had 10 or 15 minutes, I'd go out to the car and I'd read it. I would talk to people. I I was fearless. And then something begins to happen. And we've almost considered it just a natural progression of a Christian. They have the first love and then they're expected to just lose that. I've heard people say in the church, you know, talking about a new believer, somebody that just given their heart to the Lord, so on fire. I've I've heard people talk about them saying, oh, just give them time. They'll get over it. They'll get over it. They'll come. They'll be just like the rest of us. Isn't that sad? That is so sad. We need to remember That's that's what God says here. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass when all these things, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind. What's that mean? That means to remember among all the nations where the Lord God drives you. Now in verse 1 when it says all these things, 
when all these things come upon you, it obviously refers to something that has already happened. And if you go back two chapters, in chapter 28, for the first 15 verses, I encourage you to read that this afternoon. We're not going to take time now. Talk about being blessed. God promises blessing after blessing after blessing. In fact, we should read it. Go to, go to uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. We're going to at least read the blessings, maybe not the curses today. But listen to what God says. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God, and observe and do all his commandments which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on, set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come unto thee and overtake thee. I love that. It's not going to just come to thee. It's going to overtake thee, is what he says in verse 3. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall thy be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shall thou be when thou go out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses and in all that thou hast set thine hand unto and shall bless thee in the land which the Lord God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto thee if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall See that thou art called by, by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord God, excuse me, and the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, and in the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, and the land which the Lord swear unto the fathers to give thee. And the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season and bless all the work of thine hand and thou shalt lend unto thee many lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow and now i love verse 13 and the lord shall make thee the head and not the tail and thou shalt be above only and thou shalt not be beneath and if thou hearken to the commandment it just goes on and on doesn't it you like some of that how would you like to live your life experiencing these blessings that God says are yours? But you know there's a condition. We read it over. God kept repeating it. But as you get down to verse 15, there's a three-letter word, at least in my version. What does it say? But. So something's going to change here. 15 verses of blessing, and then we get to verse 15, he says, but it shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken. And I want you to know, I counted them up, there's almost 50 verses of cursings. God's getting serious. God is getting serious. Now, why does he do this? Why does God lay it out like that? Because he wants to bless you. Because he wants to bless his people. And he's telling you, again, God is not mocked. God won't be deceived. You're going to reap whatever you sow. And so God lays it out. He said, if you will do this, you will be blessed above all the people of the earth. But if you don't, all those blessings that I want to give you, I cannot give you. So Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, God foresees a time when his people would choose to go in a way opposite would choose the way of curses rather than the way of blessing. And he says, when all those things start to happen in your life, when your relationships don't seem to make sense, when you see that God isn't in what you have, you need to remember. That's what he says. You need to remember. You see, it's not God's fault. It's not God's fault. When things are, don't go according to his plan, it's your fault. Let me, say, let me say it this way. When I first became a Christian, I, I loved the book of John. John's one of my favorite gospels. I love the way John refers to himself. How is that? The disciple whom Jesus loved. And as I would read that, you know what I thought? I want to be that guy. 
I want to be the one that Jesus loved. And then it dawned on me, I could be. I could be. All of us can be. It's really about our own decision. It's about how much capacity we create in our own heart for God to fill it with his love. It's, it's really, let me, let me say it this way, that every person in here has the exact relationship with God that you've chosen to have. Does that make sense? Yeah, some of us say, oh, I'd love to have a walk with Jesus like so-and-so. Or, oh, I'd love to, you know, I, I, I want to be closer to you. But friends, the relationship you have with God is a direct result of the decisions and the priorities and the choices that you've made. But here's the good news. It can change just like that. It can. And God wants it. And I'm hoping before we're done, you'll want it too. So why is he saying all this? Why, why does he want us to remember? Because we're living in a generation where we don't take responsibility for anything anymore. We are living in a time in which we blame everyone for everything. I, I, you know, it's just crazy. We blame our parents. We blame the school system. We blame this person. We blame our neighbors. We blame our church. We'll blame anybody rather than taking personal responsibility. And that's what God's saying. Remember, you've got to remember because I've set this before you and you chose this way. So don't be surprised. You're the one that has to take responsibility. Friends, your relationship with God isn't somebody else's fault. It's yours. And you can have that relationship with God that you've always dreamed of. All you have to do is to decide to do that. We need to live our life with intentionality. Why? Because we reap what we sow. If you want good things to happen in your life, begin to make good decisions. Now what I've learned is sometimes it doesn't happen immediately, and that's the problem that we have. We do something right, and we expect God just to open the windows and just, just take care of everything. I remember uh, I, I, I started dating my wife, um, dating my wife, I dated my girlfriend, and I married her, and she became my wife. But one of the things that happened is she took me up to her parents' place. They lived out in the country, and he was a big gardener. I'd never been to garden. I've been to Walmart. That's where you get vegetables. You know, you walk into Walmart, and you pick out what you want or whatever else. And so he took me out there. It was, July, it was in July, and he had this big garden. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world to reach down on a plant and pick off something, and we ate it that day. You know, he took it in, and his wife made uh, made lunch and we ate it i thought that's awesome and so it wasn't very long that, that that bug got planted you know in my mind and i think we were even married and we we were just renting a little place in the city but i decided i wanted to have a garden and so i didn't know what to do so i i installed a garden <laughs> literally went out and got a bunch of railroad ties bought brought in bag dirt you know expensive dirt but and i mixed it you know, I, I, I kind of, and then I, I had, it was, it was, what is the railroad tie, about eight feet wide, about six feet or so, that was the size of the plot, and I planted cantaloupes, and I planted corn, and I planted watermelon, and I planted green beans, and I, I you know, my rows were about two inches apart. I mean, I, I wanted everything in that, in that garden. And I had worked and worked and worked, I made that garden, and then I planted those things and I watered them, and I came home the next day. And you know what I did? I went out to look at the garden. And there wasn't anything that I could tell had happened. And I was a little frustrated. And so the next day I came home and nothing. And so you know what I did? I started digging up the dirt to check on the seeds. Yeah. I did. I didn't understand the law of the harvest. It takes a little time. It takes a little time. I ruined... I mean, the garden was, was doomed from the beginning. I mean, I literally spent about $1,000 on that garden just trying to bring in the best dirt and all that. And, and I literally dug up half of it just trying to make sure that everything was okay because I was impatient. Friends, the same is true. I, I run into people all the time. Oh, pastor, I listened to your sermon. I went home and I read the Bible and, and I didn't get anything out of it. Where's my spiritual blessing? 
Friends, it takes time. And God knows that. And so we find that God is trying to tell us here that we need to take ownership of this. Your spiritual life in the coming weeks and months can be in the high places of the earth. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. That's what God is trying to say. We make choices. And the choices that we make will determine the outcome of where we're at. Friends, if you're going to be in heaven, it's going to be because you made good decisions. You chose to put God first in your life. You chose to focus on your relationship with Him. You chose to spend time with Him. You chose those things. That is sowing good spiritual things. All right, so that's number one. He says you're going to need to remember. So perhaps it's time for us to remember The second step, having remembered, is the second requirement, and it's simply this. God's people must return. We've got to return. Revival, again, implies we've got to go back and do something. And and that's what we find. The, The recipe or the prescription to the church that lost its first love is simply that, to remember which from which thou art fallen and redo those things. People come to me, and you know, and they want to get a divorce because they don't love each other. We're going to take a little time out, and we're going to talk about what's going on in the relationship, and we're going to rekindle some of that before we do. We're going to say, well, what is it that made you fall in love with each other to begin with? Well, we spent time together, and we went out on dates, and we did this, and we did that, and I have found that if we can go back and redo those things, you know what happens? Yeah, those affections are revived in our hearts. And so God says to return. Look at verse 2. And return to the Lord your God and obey His voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. Now throughout here, there is a focus on obedience to God's Word, but notice it's not just a focus on external obedience. It's not just about doing it because you should do it. You have to do it how? With all your heart and with all your soul. It's a matter of the heart. Your relationship with God will always be a matter of the heart. That's why God says that when you're unfaithful to Him, it's like adultery. It's adultery. It's betrayal. Because your heart belongs to Him. You gave it to Him. And you're giving it out to other other things. He sees that as adultery. Yeah, it's emotional with God, isn't it? So what is God saying? He said, you know, when you see yourself going through the motions, when you see yourself maybe even doing the right things, but the heart isn't there, he says, you need revival. You need to return to me. You need to come back. You need to repent is really what it's about. It's about repent. It's about owning up to where you're at, telling the truth to yourself, and to God, and turning your heart back to Him. Look what God says He'll do in response in verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, and the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Look at verse 8. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord, do all His commandments, which I command you today. You see, revival isn't about trying harder. It isn't about trying to live up to the code. That that is a byproduct of what happens. Revival is really about loving God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. You see, he says in here about the commandments. If you will hearken unto the commandments. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe commandments are important, and we talk about that. And I'm afraid sometimes we talk too much about the fourth one and not enough about the first one. You know what the first one is? That's the one that we're guilty of breaking when we need revival. What's the first one? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what it is. Have no other God. That means, that means friend, let me say this as plain as I know how today. That if you're sitting here today, I don't question that you love God. You wouldn't be here if you didn't love God. 
But can I ask you, is there anything or anyone that you love more than God? That's the question. Got really quiet in here. (laughs) That's why we need to repent. We live in a world that's hostile to God. It's hostile to spiritual things. You and I are in the world, but we're not to be of the world. If we become of the world, it is at war with spiritual things. We have to guard our heart. And I know what it's like, because I have people come to me, oh, pastor, I want to love God, but I don't. I see people in church crying and weeping, and I want that experience, but I don't. It's because we've been feasting upon the things of the world, and it will crowd out our love for God. So we need to repent. We need to turn back to him. So God is saying that we need to return. Now, the third step is really good news because you only have to do two. God will do the third one. And this is what God does in response to us returning to him, and that is that he will restore us. He will restore that which sin has taken away. You know, from the very beginning, that, that's what the issue is. As you see the great controversy being played out, as you see the Garden of Eden, God wanted to give to Adam and Eve and all their descendants so much, and they lost it. The devil stole. I, well, I, actually, they gave it away. They surrendered, but you know what I'm after. God wanted so much for his children, and they gave it away. When we give our heart to the Lord, and when we're walking with God, and we're experiencing that kind of relationship, God begins to restore to us that which the enemy has taken away. I've seen it time and time again. God will give us back our kids. You know, we may not have raised them right, and we're overwhelmed with guilt, but God will redeem that. That's one of the things that we forget about Jesus. He's the redeemer. He redeems things. He restores things. And that's what we find here. In verse 5, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity. He'll have compassion on you. He'll gather you again from all the nations where the Lord God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts of the earth where the Lord God will gather you, and from there he will bring you, verse 5, and the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers have possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. You know what he's promising? That that you've lost, I'll give it back to you. I'll give it back to you. That's what God wants. In Joel chapter 2, verse 25, I have it on the screen here because I don't want you to take time to go to it. It says, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. God will restore what has been eaten away. In fact, just a few verses later, Joel talks about the latter rain. Joel 2, 28, we were studying about that in our, actually in prayer meeting. We were talking a little bit about that. Yeah, God will, what what he's doing there is he's restoring those things. So when we as a church, when we as individuals begin to live according to God's purpose and plan for our life, God will begin to work. God will begin to pour his blessings out. God will begin to restore those things that maybe the enemy has taken away. But notice something really important here in verse 6. He says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul that you may live. Did you get that? Why did he circumcise the heart? To love the Lord your God with all your heart. Again, this emphasis is internal. The circle is complete. We're to return to him, and then God says, as you return to me, I will circumcise your heart, and he does that to give us a greater capacity to love him. He cuts away the flesh and leaves a heart that's tender and open so that we will love him even more. Would you like a heart that has a greater capacity to love God? Would you like that this morning? Wouldn't that be a great thing to leave church with? A heart that has a greater capacity to love God. Well, verse 9. And the Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and the fruit of your body, the increase of your livestock, the produce of your land for good. The Lord will again rejoice over you for good. He has rejoiced over your fathers. 
I love that. I love when there's something that I can do that makes God happy. And that's what it is. It's not just that we're rejoicing, but the rejoicing here is God that rejoices. I mean, when we return to Him, that's why I know revival is part of God's plan. He can't wait for it to happen. And the Bible says that when He does, He rejoices over us. It reminds me of another verse in the book Zephaniah. We're leaving Deuteronomy. This is our last text. In Zephaniah, it's right there near the end of the Old Testament. One of my favorite verses. Do you remember what it was like when you were in love? When you were, maybe you dropped your girlfriend off and went home. Remember that, that's what you're supposed to do. I used to drop Charlene off and I'd be in my car and I'd just break out in song. If I didn't know the words, I made them up. Just singing with all my heart. That's what happens when you love someone, right? You just, you can't help but sing. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, notice what God says here. And the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Would you like to make God sing this morning? Man, I can't think of anything that would be more exciting than watching and doing something that would make heaven rejoice. You know, the Bible says it is about the heart because when a man or woman walks down into that watery grave, it says that all of heaven rejoices. And when those of us that have maybe wandered away, maybe without ever leaving the house, when we turn our hearts back to him, I believe he begins to sing. So let me ask you a question as we close today. How is it between you and God? Has there ever been a time when you've been more in love with Jesus than today? Has there ever been a time when you have walked with him closer than you are today? Is there anything in your life that you love more than Jesus. If there is, friend, it's time to return. God, God is calling us to get serious. You know, we can pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but uh, I'm trying to think of the text in Acts. It's about Acts 7, 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. He isn't going to give us the outpouring of the Holy Spirit unless we're yielded to Him. Unless we're willing to surrender. Now, I don't know what your practice is here, but I want to invite you to stand as we close. And we're going to sing a song, one of, one of my favorite hymns, My Jesus, I Love Thee. I want you to say the words. I want you to sing. Let this melody ring in your ears and in your heart. And if today you'd like to make a decision to just make sure that there's nothing between you and Jesus, if you're ready to make that surrender again, and I'm not, I, again, I don't mean that you've wandered far away, but that you're just ready to say, God, you're first in my life again, I want to invite you to step out and come to the front. This is a place. This is a place of sacrifice. This is a place of surrender. This is a place of commitment. This is a place of dedication and consecration. So as the worship team leads us in this song, if you feel that just before you walk out of this building today, you want to make sure that Jesus doesn't pass you by, that you're ready to get serious with him. As I said, we're going to talk about revival for a few more weeks. But our purpose is not just to talk about it, it's to experience it. If there was ever a time, the time is now. And it all starts with a matter of the heart. Do you love Jesus? So let's sing together as we close.
want to invite those that come forward just to join hands together. And maybe you'd want to do that with someone sitting next to you uh, there in the pew. Thank you for receiving the message this morning. I believe God wants to do a great thing. That God is ready to get serious with His people if we will get serious with Him. And so today begins a journey of making good decisions, of sowing good spiritual things. I want to invite you to continue that, to add to that day by day, because God is interested in bringing you even closer to Him. So thank you for that today. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the incredible privilege of hearing and experiencing your word. Lord, these aren't words that were just written 3,000 years ago. But Lord, these are words that live within our heart today. They reveal to us the heart of the Father. They reveal to us the love of Jesus. They reveal to us your plan and purpose for our life. And Lord, as a church, as God's people today, we would have to admit there are times when we have done our own thing when we have allowed the affections of the world to crowd out our love for God. And Lord, today, in this moment, we confess that. We do not want that any longer. Lord, we want a love for you that is pure, that is strong, that is unbroken and unrivaled. We're tearing down the high places in our hearts. And Lord, we ask that you would come in and fill us with your goodness and your power. Circumcise our hearts. Cut away that worldly flesh and give us that soft heart. Take away those stones. And Lord, give us a tender heart. And then, Lord, take up residence there. It's all yours. We hold nothing back. There are no rooms that you are not allowed to go into, but Lord, invade our hearts and our lives. We're not going to be Seventh-day Adventists. We're going to love you every day. We're going to serve you every day. And so we give ourselves to you today. Lord, we pray your blessing upon the people of God. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for the gift of Jesus and salvation and hope of heaven that's in our hearts. Not just that we can live forever, that we can reach out one day and grab a hold of the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. Thank you for Jesus today. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Remember we have our fellowship meal. We hope that you'll stay by.